Hello everyone, I hope you're all having a wonderful night tonight. It's Akizil here, and tonight I'll be continuing my reaction to Lionel John's return to explain Warhammer 40k lore by Wes Hammer. I hope, hope everyone enjoyed the reaction last time. You should definitely subscribe to Wes Hammer's channel and give the original video a like. He really deserves it. Good. And a link to that will be in the description below. But without further ado, let's see what Zabriel is up to now. Now, Zabriel is acting as the lion's emissary, and he's given a picked recording of the lion's testimony vouching for his character. This testimony orders all that encounter him to offer him whatever assistance they can. Now, Zabriel's pretty confident this will work with most people he comes across, but if any of them happen to be modern dark angels, revealing the lion's message would be seen as an even greater heresy to them than whatever crimes they believe he is guilty of. When he arrives on the moon, he is greeted by two more fallen, one in Mark III armor who introduces himself as Knight Sergeant Lonseal, and another in hulking cataphractic Terminator armor known as Galad. They take little convincing to come to the lion's side. Now, first and foremost, they want to see if it's actually true, and they don't want to miss this opportunity to see their gene sire's face. But additionally, whatever misgivings they have about the Primarch, there's only so much they can do to protect the people of this world, and they would not deny them the protection that a Primarch could offer. They also tell Zabriel that there's another member of the Fallen, a Psyker, who was taken to living out in the desert as a hermit. He was more than welcome to go and visit him, as they often did, but he had removed himself from the conflict and most likely wouldn't join. They organize a speeder vessel for Zabriel, who then takes off to find his lost brother. When he hmm. A hermit living in the desert, and he's a Psyker. I wonder if this is going to be like Dark Angels Obi-Wan, basically. He locates him in a cave. He's surprised to see that there is another member. Which actually, funny thing, I heard that like back in like first edition Rogue Trader days, that 40k had its own parody of Obi-Wan, who was just really ridiculous. ...of the Fallen here as well. The other guy's name is Baylor, and he actually follows the leader of the Ten Thousand Eyes, Seraphax. So we're given a scene where Zabriel is trying to convince the Psyker to come over to his side and join the Lion, and Baylor is trying to convince him to join the Ten Thousand Eyes. The big takeaway from the conversation hmm. between the three of them is that the Psyker reveals that the Lion was telling the truth. He was fired on first. They believe that he had turned traitor and had come back to Caliban to gather up whatever resources were left in order to continue the fight against the Imperium. But even if Luther had been lying to them, even if this wasn't true, the Primarch was still at fault. He had watched the entire Imperium fall around him rather than let these Space Marines fight. Whereas Horus had brought every asset at his disposal to bring down the Emperor, the Lion had left 30,000 of the greatest soldiers ever created to sit on a backwater planet. He was either a traitor or grossly incompetent. Or on the other end of the spectrum, he viewed his sons as one of those two things. How could there possibly be any reconciliation after that? Or alternatively, he felt, felt it necessary to, to leave behind a defense force to make sure that, say, the traitors didn't try to, to strike at Caliban. And while, while most of the Dark Angels were all busy, you know, were dealing with other things. But hey, when it seems like you've been neglected ed, ed, by, ed, by a parental figure, you're, uh, yeah, sometimes just being left to stew with your thoughts it's, it's, is, 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 is worse than anything chaos will do to you. When it's all said and done, Zabriel wants the Psyker to join him and the Lion to fight for humanity, and Baylor wants him to join his cause and follow the Ten Thousand Eyes. He denies them both, and they both leave. No blows coming to each other, even though, by all accounts, they are enemies, and the next time they meet won't be on the sparring grounds like it was in the old days. This interaction reveals that the Fallen have a very complicated relationship with one another. Even if they fall on different ends of the chaotic spectrum, there is a kinship and a bond amongst the hunted that cannot be denied, even if they disagree with what the best path forward is. They harbor no love for either the Imperium or the other followers of Chaos, but they simply leave each other hmm. to follow their own path rather than coming to blows. However, after Baylor leaves, the Psyker tells Zabriel to wait, and he agrees to come with him. At the very least, he wants to see the lion for himself. Okay, so now back to what the lion was doing during this time. 
Night Captain Bors, or Bors One Eye as his compatriots call him due to his missing eye that has not been fitted with an augmentation, informs the Lion that back at their base of operations there were more fallen, but it would require making multiple short warp jumps in order to get there. Not the best way of traveling, but it's pretty much how the fallen have to get around considering their circumstances and lack of resources. Well, also for those who may not know, um, it is actually possible to navigate the warp without a navigator, or because a because a computer actually in 40k it can accurately plot short warp jumps. So it's not as efficient for long journeys, but you can make a journey by doing a series of, of short warp jumps one after the other or, and hopping and hopping across the warp essentially to reach your location, which is what I assume that the Fallen have, have had to do. While this process is happening, the lion takes some time to meditate in his chamber. This is actually a process that he's not very good at. In fact, thinking about nothing is the opposite of his skill set. You see, the lion is an entity of perfect singular focus. It's a skill he had to develop to survive in the woods of Caliban, and it's a mindset that has come to dominate how he views things. He can focus on any one thing better than anyone else alive, but clearing his mind entirely is nearly impossible for him. I can see then why it is, is that, he, that he just immediately went to firing on the Fallen and just assumed that all of them were a traitor and never actually looked into it, because uh, being very single-minded like that... Uh, yeah, leads a tunnel vision. Which, considering the endless barrage of dilemmas, problems, thoughts, and questions that have been plaguing his mind since he woke back up, uh, this makes a lot of sense. The more he tries to focus on clearing his mind, the more aggressive these thoughts become. For a moment, he thinks back what happened on Caliban. He didn't want to fire on his world, but he had. And when he thinks about it, those munitions that he used had no real possibility of shattering an entire world. They just weren't powerful enough. It must have had something to do with the foul sorcery that Luther was employing. He tries to shake these thoughts away and focus on the forest of Caliban. Even though his eyes are shut, his senses inform him that his surroundings have changed. He huh, so it really was warp magic. Okay then. He opens his eyes and he's no longer in the chambers aboard his ship. He is once again in the forest. He was not anticipating this to happen, but he thinks to himself that he probably should have, and wonders if this strange teleporting ability is something that he will be able to control. When he opens his eyes, he realizes that he is next to a large castle, and when he goes inside, he eventually comes upon a great hall where a wounded king is seated in front of three objects, a chalice, a candelabra, and a golden spear dripping with blood. The wounded king has a pool of blood pooling at his feet, and he tries to speak with the king whose eyes turn in his direction. But other than that, he makes no indication that he even acknowledges his presence. He asks him who he is, but there's no response from the king. He asks him how he can be healed, but once again, the king just looks annoyed. He goes to open his mouth to ask a third question, and suddenly, the shadows cast by the king's throne start to reach out towards him. He realizes that they are the same shadows that were in the river, the one that the Watcher warned would kill him. The last thing he sees is a look of great disappointment on the wounded king's face before he suddenly finds himself back in his chambers on his ship, the Vox chiming to warn him that they had arrived at the pirate station. The station- Hmm. You know, oh, given that there's this, this wounded king on a throne, on a, on a, with, on a, with the, and all that, that, that's just sitting there silently, I get the feeling that that's supposed to be, be like a, like a stand-in for the emperor. These marines have made their home is of ancient Xenos design. There's a great wrongness about it. It's not obviously dangerous or covered in spikes and skulls or anything like that, but every angle is off ever so slightly. It makes it even more disturbing to look at because you can't quite tell what unnerves you. The Lion asks Bors what he thinks of utilizing a Xeno structure like this, especially when they had been tasked with eradicating all Xenos that posed a threat to mankind. Bors tells him quite simply that if it hadn't been for this station, him and the men under his command would have been long dead, so you do what you have to do. The Lion thinks back to the Emperor and how stuff like this should have been destroyed. It was what they were made to do, but he also realizes that the Emperor isn't here, and that he had to step out from behind his father's shadow and make the decisions he felt were best. He's not surprised that his sons had followed a similar path of logic. He mentions that he would give anything for one of his brothers to be here by his side. This was all such a huge burden for him to bear alone. 
Bors asks him, even Russ? And he thinks about that for a moment, <laughs> before saying yes, even Russ. His Wolf King brother had a remarkable simplicity about him, that although it would have been infuriating, it would have been welcomed. When they board the I still love how, uh, how, how, you know, oh, oh, like when, Station. when the Emperor came to Fenris and challenged Russ, uh, like, how, how Russ could eat and drink more than the Emperor, and then the Emperor tells that he, that he, that, that told him, like, basically, that these are not things to be proud of, and called him, like, was it, like, was that glutton and a drunk, or something like that? The lion comes face to face with about seven of his sons, five of which are clad in black, one in the white of an apothecary, and another in the rust red of a tech marine. He tells his sons that he is glad to see them, and one of them asks if he is there to kill them. He says that he's not here to kill anyone, and tells them of everything he has learned since he awoke. Of the treachery of Luther, Astalon, and all the others allied to them. How he has since found sons that he believed had no involvement or knowledge of the attack. He tells the pirates that if you wish me to, I will leave you in peace, and I will make every attempt to make every one of my sons who wear the mantle of a dark angel to do the same. The only I honestly get the feeling that if Lionel Johnson came out and said and said to stop hunting the fallen, with the exception being those that, that are actually following chaos, then <laughs> why do I get the feeling that some of his sons and like well actually a lot of them probably would just assume the, um, that the lion that the lion himself of is was either possessed by a demon or B, there was a demon taking the form of the lion in to deceive them, because I really do not believe that they would uh that they would take to that at, at readily, given, you know, the ten thousand year crusade they've been on trying to hunt down the fallen in secret. The only exception is if you prey upon humanity and continue to do so. The Tech Marine steps forward and tells him that from his perspective, it's been seven hundred years since the breaking of Caliban. And in that time, he's seen the Imperium to be a worse place than ever. It was wretched, short-sighted, superstitious, and hateful. It clung to tenants it didn't understand, in pursuit of goals it could not remember and would never realize. Why should they fight to protect what was left of it? The Lion tells him that the Imperium by all accounts is gravely flawed, but many of the people within it bear no responsibility for that. They were beset on all sides by ravening Xenos the Dark Angels had failed to exterminate, and by foul powers that our brother legions and indeed some of our own battle brothers had enslaved themselves to. He asks, should we leave these mortals to reap the consequences of their ancestors' decisions and the failures of the Astartes and the Primarchs? The lion points to the humans that are aboard this ship. The fallen here were protecting them and asks them why not extend their borders. This is where the braggart Kai steps forward from behind the lion and points at them accusingly, saying these fallen were scared. Up until this point, the atmosphere in the room was pretty tense to say the least, but because of Kai's outburst, that has been shattered. The fallen of the Echo Station are raising their weapons, and the lion looks at him to rebuke him, but realizes it's too late. Kai goes to give this speech. I know the feeling. I felt it too, back in the days of the Great Crusade. I was part of something huge. I had my brothers around me, and I knew my purpose. Even when we were exiled on Caliban, I felt that connection. More so, even, because I knew that there was so much good that I could be doing if I were simply allowed to get out there and do it. He drops his hands to his sides. And then the breaking happened. And the storm threw me through space and time, and I ended up alone and without purpose. Even when I found a pair of companions, we had no plan other than to keep our heads down and survive. How could we three make a difference to the galaxy? He points at the lion. But now we can, brothers. Our gene father says he has no wish to rule, and I believe him. But you must realize that everywhere he goes, humanity will cling to him like a drowning person to a flotation device. They will hang off his words and take his statements as law. Even if it's only a handful of star systems, that is still trillions of lives that the lion will be protecting. You have- Oh yeah, cause yeah, since like, the Primarchs would be viewed as gods and like, once they actually know that it is in fact like, the real Lionel Johnson, there's quite a few people who would similar to what happened and with with that psyker with that sanctioned psyker once he you know uncovered that yes it was a lion like they would just prostrate themselves at his feet immediately of the choice of joining him finding a new purpose standing next to other warriors and having no enemies other than those who seek to destroy humanity or refusing him 
remaining here and waiting for a passing Xenos fleet to grant you a meaningless death, or to finally be captured and tortured by the Unforgiven. The tech marine from before asked the lion what of his other companion, gesturing to the Red Whisper. Does he have a similar eloquence to Kai? In a growl, the Red Whisper tells him that he does not, that he does as the lion wishes him to, and that was the end of it. When they hear his voice, though, the apothecary notes that the rasp he hears sounds like an old injury and asks if he needs medical attention. The lion informs them that Lohawk does not remove his battle plate in the sight of others, but they thank him for his concern. The other fallen ask him why he doesn't find that strange. The lion tells them that he suspects many of his sons have developed quirks since the breaking. He would not condemn without proof. Lohawk had pledged himself to the lion and given no reason to doubt his word. He also, since they were cast through the warp, it's entirely possible that they could have picked up maybe a mutation or something as well, now that I think about it. He would extend the same trust to all of them. There's an obvious shift in the mood here, and the lion realizes that his words have struck on something. The Dark Angels had always prided themselves on being the first, the best, the template that all Astartes were built upon. He wonders what insecurities have developed in his sons in their long period of isolation, unable to influence the greater galaxy. There is fear here, but not fear of death or pain. A space marine would face that unflinchingly. It was a fear that they had lost the only thing that told them who they were, and that any attempt to reclaim it would see those fears confirmed. The lion tells them, my sons, you and I spent centuries doing what we were told. Now I simply wish for you to do what is right, and I need your help to do it, for so long as you will give me that help. They ask him who he is fighting, and he tells them of the 10,000 eyes. Now these fallen are very familiar with Seraphax and his filth, and if that was who the lion was going up against, then they were with him. He was one of Luther's favorites back on Caliban, and he was without a doubt a traitor through and through. The lion has gathered more of his sons to his side, but this happy moment is ruined when he suddenly receives word from his ship that they had picked up a distress call coming from Camarith, the first world the lion had found himself on, and the first one he had reclaimed in his crusade. The 10,000 eyes had returned, and without him there to protect them, they had burned the entire planet. The lion and the fallen that have joined him that he now... That, well, that's gotta suck. All those people... That the Zabriel was protecting for all these years. It's like, as soon as he steps away, gone. Refers to as the Risen, move as quickly as they can, but by the time they get back to the planet, it had been too late. This wasn't a conquest, it was a slaughter, similar to the ones the Dark Angels had committed against hundreds of Xeno species in the days of the Great Crusade. Now, this is where he meets back up with Zabriel, as his ship had received the same distress signal. He briefly introduces the fallen that he has found to their gene sire, but more proper introductions will have to wait as there were more pressing matters at hand. The lion asks Zabriel if he had seen what had happened to Camarath, and he tells him that he had. The lion can sense an overwhelming burden of grief in his son, seeing the world he had fought so hard to protect in flames. The Blood Angel's bunker from Seeing everything that you work towards just go up in flames. That's, that's a recurring theme in, in 40k. It happened to the Emperor, happening here again. From earlier in the story, is one of the only places that is not on fire, and the lion feels that tugging sensation from before. There was something there for him to find. Him and his sons journey to the planet's surface, and when they arrive at the fortress, they encounter a Chaos Space Marine who has a- Actually, also, yeah, happened to Lorgar, happened to Magnus too, actually message for the lion, but he will only grant it if he is struck down. Zabriel obliges, cutting his head off, but the Chaos Warrior doesn't fall. His body simply stands back up, picks up his severed head, and his mouth whispers silent words. Then he vanishes into thin air. None of them could hear the message, except for Zabriel, who informs the group that Seraphax wished to meet with the lion on the world of Sable. I actually went over this section of the book in my previous video, The Plot to Kill the Emperor, so you should definitely check that out, but I'll briefly summarize the following events here. The lion has learned that he can use meditation to teleport back to the ethereal forest, so he attempts to do so by bringing his sons with him. They all close their eyes and meditate together, and sure enough, they end up in the ethereal ghost of Caliban's woods. This is the path they used to hmm. infiltrate Sable, as although their ship had entered the space surrounding the world, if they had gotten any closer, pretending they had come in good faith, they were well aware that Seraphax's warband would have shot them down. They don't know exactly what he's planning to do, but they're sure it has something to do with the grotesque floating disc orbiting around the planet made from the bones of every single person that had lived here before the 10,000 eyes had come and slaughtered them. The uh, so a giant 
bone disc over the planet made from its dead population. Okay, I, I, I wonder what kind of chaos ritual is going on with this. Something like this doesn't sound Zinchian. It honestly sounds more cornate, to be honest, but corn mostly focused on the skulls. Probably Chaos Undivided, I would, I would assume. Lion and the Risen infiltrate the governor's palace, where Serifax makes his presence known. He leads them on a great chase, but what the Lion doesn't realize is that this is a trap, and Serifax binds him with a set of unbreakable chains and begins conducting a ritual designed to pull the Lion's soul from his body. Now, this dude is absolutely crazy, a Chaos Sorcerer, but when he reveals what his ultimate goal is, it's not what we as the audience are expecting. He says that in order for humanity to survive, chaos must be destroyed, and the only person that could do that was the Emperor. But in order for the Emperor to do that, his physical body would have to be killed so his spiritual body could ascend to godhood. He planned to possess the lion's physical body so he could walk into the Imperial Palace unchallenged and slay the master of mankind. The lion will not allow this to happen. Even I mean, that would also cause a second Eye of Terror to open up in the middle of the soul system as well. Even if the sorcerer's words are true, his sons needed him and humanity needed him. He would not abandon them again. Before the ritual can complete, the Risen break into the chamber and destroy a mirror that was being used as part of the ritual and attack Serifax, who ascends into something of a demon prince and fights back against them. The ascended Serifax proves to be incredibly powerful and sucks the souls out of all of the Risen, trapping them in his wings. All hope seems lost, when suddenly Baylor, the chaos fallen from before that had argued with Zabriel in the Cave of the Psyker, betrays his master, grabbing his dagger and running him through with it. Outraged, Serifax spins around and plunges his claws into his chest. With Serifax being killed, all of the fallen souls get released from his wings and back into their body, and the lion is able to break free from his chains. He asks Baylor what made him switch sides, and Baylor tells him because that wasn't Serifax anymore. He had lost his way, and when he saw the lion and the risen fighting side by side, he knew that this was not the same man who had attacked Caliban. Serifax had turned his magic against them, but the lion fought to defend his fallen sons. The lion tells him that they are with him because they choose to be. This galaxy may call them fallen, but he calls them the Risen. Likewise, he tells Baylor to rise. Baylor protests, telling him that he is a heretic. The lion tells him that this legion was his responsibility. He did not see what had festered in the hearts of his sons or his fallen brothers of the Order. If he had done so, maybe all of this could have been avoided. He tells him that you turn from the course of your own will, and tells Baylor once again to rise. Baylor does so and rises to his feet, saying that he did, but it was too late. The lion sadly agrees. He says that the wiles of chaos run deep, but he wants Baylor to know that in coming to the aid of him and his sons this day, he had gained his gratitude and his forgiveness. Baylor tells him that he knows he will not survive the wounds that Serifax had inflicted on him, so he asks the lion for a cleaner death. He picks up fealty to grant his wayward son the Emperor's mercy, but he hesitates. He had sworn that he would not see any more of his sons die this day, and he's loath to prove himself a liar, even if Baylor had asked for this. He nods and raises fealty, severing his head in one smooth motion. After this is done, the lion tells his son equipped with a flamer to burn as much of this place as he can. After this, they depart. This victory was significant, but there was still much for them left to do. In the aftermath of these events, it... Well, one, one could say that matters not at how, at how many times you stumble and fall. What matters is, 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 is that you get up afterwards. And it's, it's rather nice is that seeing, seeing them, them get, some measure, get some measure of redemption. And... The 10,000 Eyes would fracture into hundreds of different competing factions, each vying for power. The Lion would go on to unite and defend more worlds, slowly prying Imperium Nihilus back from the traitors. Wherever he goes, he is hailed as a hero, a protector, a god, a notion that he steps back from always, but he realizes that it's inescapable. His father is seen as a divine being, and thus accordingly, his risen son will also be seen as at least semi-divine. It's a notion the Lion finds incredibly distasteful, but at the same time, he understands that the people that live in the horrors of Imperium Nihilus are desperate for something to believe in. And if they are so desperate to find a god figure, he would rather it be him than the other horrors that lurk in the Immaterium. He has one final thing. 
you don't even need to look at the Materium for things that people would see as gods. That's like there, like there are people who, when you really think about it, might even consider the Drukari to be gods, because a Drukari moves fast enough that of that well, the normal Eldar humans move in slow motion. It's even more pronounced with the, with the Drukari because, as, as their psychic abilities have atrophied, it, their physical abilities have increased. They've become um, faster and stronger than their craft world cousins. Such that there are cases of them um, ducking and weaving thing, or, thing, to, thing, like their way through last gunfire to avoid being hit. And, it, and, and kicking gren airborne grenades back at the person who threw them and feats like that. So honestly, like, after, like, seeing a display like that at from a Drukari, there are some people who might see them as a god if they didn't know better. People who might also see a Drukari homunculus as a god, because the things that homunculi can do are wild. ...that he has been putting off for too long, but now believes that he has the strength to see it through. Through his meditation, he journeys to the forest once again and finds himself in front of the building with the smooth dome that the Watcher had warned him about. The Watcher is standing there waiting for him, and the Lion tells him, When I first encountered this place, you said I was not strong enough yet. The Watcher tells him that he wasn't. He asks him if he's strong enough now, and the Watcher says that that remains to be seen. He steps inside, and he is wholly not prepared for what he is about to find as out of the darkness steps a figure of similar stature to himself, a Primarch with a rough face and long blonde hair, much like his own, but partially braided, armor in the gray of winter instead of the black of night, a face with flashing blue eyes and elongated canine teeth. Lehman Russ growls, hello, traitor, before launching himself forward to attack. And Wait a minute. Lehman Russ thinks that Lionel Johnson's a traitor? Hmm. No, no. I had the exact same reaction when I read this. My jaw hit the floor, the whole thing. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, as it's not actually what it appears to be. It turns out that what was in here was some type of warp entity, and this was the final trial of the forest for the lion to face. Oh, because for a second there, like I was not expecting thing either Lehman Russ to be in there, or for him to him to call Lionel Johnson a traitor and engages him in combat and takes the form of each and every one of his brothers, each who mock him for his failures. It shifts from Russ to Horus and then through all of the rest of the Primarchs, each one pushing him to his absolute limits and beating him to a pulp. He fights back against every single one of them, and the final one being the one he dreaded the most, Kurs. During his fight with the Night Haunter, he suddenly sees light glaring from a kite shield hanging on the wall. It's richly decorated and embossed with an eagle crowned with laurels. He reaches out for it, and when he touches it, he has a vision. He's suddenly standing on a battlefield under a dark sky, but when he looks up, he can see all of the stars, and he knows each and every one of them by name. He can feel everything around him, all the humans hurting and bleeding and dying. By the way, the fact that Shield has laurels on it just immediately made me think Ultramarines. All the Xeno species, all of those abominations, and all the tiny creatures burrowing through the soil, and the trees, and the grass, and the wind, he can feel it all. It's all connected, a web of power, and somehow, this is not overwhelming. This is just how he lives, instant to instant to instant to instant to instant. He staggers and the vision is gone, but he knows the touch of that mind. He has felt it before. It was his father. Conrad Kurz lunges out of the dark. Wait, so that's how the Emperor perceives reality? Like, he feels everything? How he... How he doesn't get overwhelmed by that is just... That, that is amazing. Darkness with his claws aimed for the lion's heart. The lion brings up the Emperor's shield, deflecting the blow. Kurs, or whatever the warp thing wearing his face that his father had set to guard this place, shrieks and recoils from the shield. The lion can feel the echo of the Emperor's Aegis, the great power his father had used to shield the Imperial Palace during the Siege of Terra, coursing through the shield. He lashes out, slamming the shield into his brother and pinning him to the ground against its glowing radiance. 
The warp creature shrieks in pain and dissolves against the shield's light. Watching his brother die the death he could never bring himself to inflict on him brings him no satisfaction. But it's done. The past is dead now. And in the grim darkness of the far future, there was only war. Some amount of time passes, and we learn that the lion is desperately searching for some word that part of the Imperium still remains. He's been sending expeditionary fleets out and broadcasting messages on every possible channel. But with each new world they find in Imperium Nihilus, the story is the same. They've been cut off, and they have no wider knowledge of the rest of the galaxy, or what is going on on the other side of the Great Rift. He hopes that the Imperium survives, and that he just happened to end up in a place where the warp storms were particularly bad, but he has no way of confirming this. He worries that, although the people here are grateful and willingly followed him, that they had only done so because they were desperate for a protector. What will happen when he encounters a section of the Shattered Imperium that has been able to cling to the old ways? Will they denounce him as an imposter and declare war on him and the people he has sworn to protect? What will he do then? He doesn't want to create an empire and he doesn't want to supplant the Imperium, but he knows what it will look like to the others. What if when the Imperium does come, its intentions are hostile? It's at this point that several ships appear. They bear the heraldry of the Blood Angels and they hail the Lion. They wish to meet with him. A trio of three Thunderhawks touch down and 60 Blood Angels descend the ramps. One of them in ornate golden armor, a jump pack rising from his back and a very particular golden mask obscuring his face, the Death Mask of Sanguinius. This infuriates the Lion, who at this point had high hopes for the meeting, but he flies into a rage, demanding to know who the hell this guy was to wear the face of his brother. This initial gut reaction is proof enough to Dante of the Lion's authenticity. He removes his mask to reveal to the Lion an age-worn face, far older than even Zabriel. The Blood Angels drop to their knees and kneel before him. Dante introduces himself as commander of the Blood Angels chapter and tells him that he has never felt a presence quite like this before, except for the last time he met a Primarch. A phrase that causes the lion the last time to pause. Another one of his brothers yet lived. Who was it? Dante tells him of Lord Gilliman's resurrection, of the Primaris Marines, and the launching of the Indomitus Crusade to take back the Imperium from its enemies. The Imperium still existed. He was not alone in this galaxy, and humanity still lived on. There would be more defenders that he could link up with to face off against those that would prey upon humanity. But all of that pales in comparison to the one thought that rises in his mind. Gilliman. The lion was not alone. Ah, yes. <clears throat> the, yes. The lion in realizes that it's good old Gorilla Man. Yeah, that yeah, that that warp entity taking the fate taking the face of, of Russ really threw me threw me for a loop for a second there. Also, is that is is that a knoll who's who is I assume that's a word bear? Oh, so that's what what that's what what Wes's icon is. Yeah, that that was that was fun to watch, and I hope you guys enjoyed watching with me. Uh, def again, you should definitely check out the Wes Hammer's channel. We'll give him give him a like, subscribe to him, and if you enjoyed the reaction, I'd appreciate if you like, comment, and subscribe. But until next time, ta ta, and I hope you all have have a wonderful night. It's be nice to each other and all and it and and I hope of the night finds you in the well. Thank you.